Today is the day, the much anticipated day for several years. People have been looking forward to this particular day, September 21st, 2017. But they're especially looking forward to September 23rd, 2017. But today is the official start or the official day of Rosh Hashanah, otherwise known to us worst Western churchgoers as the Feast of Trumpets, or as Leviticus would put it, and I'm going to read out Leviticus, the Memorial of Blowing. So Leviticus chapter 23 and it is starting in verse 23. This is what it says, and there's not much said about it, incidentally. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of the trumpets, a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And that's all that is said of Rosh Hashanah in the book of Leviticus. The memorial of blowing. So why is this such a big deal? Well, the big deal for this year is, is two things. On September 23rd, you'll have the Revelation 12 sign, if in fact it is the Revelation 12 sign. For you see, John wrote that there would be a great wonder in heaven. Now, this particular wonder can't even be seen in the heavens because it's a daytime sign. The sun is at her head or around about her head and shoulder area. So the sun obscures your ability to see the stars. All right, and then the moon is at her feet. But the moon is a new moon that can't even be seen on September 22nd. It, it will be seen as the very first sliver which indicates a new moon. So it will be kind of very partially seen. On September 22nd, it will be 6% illumination. September 23rd, it will be at 12% illumination. And you will be able to partially see that at night. So I, I do call into question, is this the sign? Is this the wonder that John was writing about. But let's, let's say that it is for the moment because I am watching it. Make no mistake, I am watching this sign. I'm paying very close attention to it and so should you. But the other, the other issue in regard to this sign is that Scott infers, well he does more than infer, he directly states that soon as this male child is born, it is immediately caught up to be with God. We don't know God's definition of immediate. We do have some indicators, however, as to what immediate could possibly mean. And I'm going to touch on that. But the inference that Scott was making, and actually he was doing more than an inference, was that immediately after the church is gone, that the tribulation would begin. This is only, this is my major bone of contention with uh, Scott Clark and his video. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be making another video right after this one coming to the defense of Scott Clark pertaining to another issue. All right. But. So stay tuned for that. But this is what it says. There is only one thing that I am aware of in Scripture that indicates that the tribulation 
has begun and it is definitive all right in Daniel chapter 9 starting in verse 27 I'm going to read it I know for some of you I'm preaching to the choir but there are those that may have never heard this before Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 this is what it says and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of the abomination he shall make it desolate even until the consumption and that determined shall be poured upon the desolation now I'm not going to break down the last half and all that here today but the point of the matter is the only event that triggers the tribulation that I am aware of in Scripture is the signing of a covenant and it doesn't even say that there's a signing of a covenant what it says is that he will confirm or agree with a covenant that Israel had made all right so a lot of people are looking for Israel to make an agreement with their enemies so that the enemies of Israel do not trodden Israel under because that's the purpose of the agreement in accordance with Isaiah chapter 28 uh, I believe starting in verse 8 uh, verse 14 it says this pertaining to this covenant with death and with hell wherefore hear the word of the Lord ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement when the overflowing scourge shall pass through it shall not come to us for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves. You see, Israel has a major concern that war is going to pass through them, and they are trying to avoid that war from passing through them. All right? So this is uh, what is believed to be the covenant that they signed. Now, a lot of people think that they are coming into a, a, a type of agreement with their enemies, you know, like ISIS and things of that nature, uh, the Taliban and uh, everybody that wants to wipe them off the map. But there is another possibility, and I've never heard anybody state this possibility before, so I believe it's original with me. But you remember when uh, President Donald Trump went to the Middle East, to Saudi Arabia, and there were many nations, uh, Islamic nations, represented in Saudi Arabia when President Trump addressed them. What if, and most of them were westernized Muslim nations, such as Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Emirates and things of that nature, but what if this treaty or this covenant that they enter into is with those people that are and and they go into league with the westernized Islamic nations and agree that they will help come to the aid and defense of Israel and that is what puts the up-and-coming Antichrist in a position to agree that I will not pass through. I'm just throwing that out there on the table. So it's not necessarily that Israel has to enter into a covenant or treaty with their enemies, but with their supposed newfound friends and it's the friends that end up betraying Israel and not coming to their aid because the because it, over here we find in Isaiah 28 
that God himself intervenes and nullifies that treaty or that covenant. So, that's just speculation on my part. But what is not speculation is what triggers the time of the tribulation. Now, pertaining to the time of the tribulation and the, the uh, gap between the harpazo or the rapture and the beginning of the tribulation, there are a lot of people that are looking for this sign of Revelation chapter 12 to be it, to be the time of the rapture. Not so. If anything, it is calling us, it is giving us a warning bell, a time to make good with the, the remaining time that God has given us. You see, soon as the church is gone, those that dwell on the earth are going to be facing a rough way to go. And there's so many people looking for the rapture right now, but yet they are not doing the work of Jesus Christ in spreading the gospel. They're going, I want to go home. I don't care about these people that we leave behind. Well, I do care about these people that we leave behind, and not all of them have to be left behind, you see. If we are in a time of reprieve in accordance with the Donald Trump prophecies, and we are in a time of reprieve, let's just say, then we need to be making hay while the sun shines. Because this is only a limited window of opportunity. Just a limited window of opportunity that we are given. And it doesn't make sense to me that the church would be taken out of here during the time of a... Now, I, I can be wrong. This is just speculation on my part. But it doesn't make sense that when we're given an opportunity for the church to flourish, for it to spread its wings and start bringing people into the kingdom of God, that we would be then taken out. You see, but it does say, in such an hour as you think not, so will the Son of Man be. You know, that's when he'll be coming, when at the time that you don't think he's going to be coming. So I could be a little off base here, but the second part is, it has long been speculated and even prophesied that there would be one last revival. We don't know what this last revival is going to look like, but I can tell you this, it is not going to look like revivals of the past. It is going to be most likely born out of darker times. Darker times, you see, because as the times get darker, the light, it becomes more obvious. It's not that the light's shining brighter, it's that the light becomes more obvious in... in, in in uh, when, when times get darker, all right, you can't see a candle very far away when it's lit, when the, when the sun's out. But when the sun goes down, you can see that candle from seven miles away. That is that very same candle. So, and there's one more thing I, I wanted to point out. Uh, I'm sure it's been pointed out before. It's not the, as though it's a secret. But in Revelation chapter 6, it's most famous for the four horsemen. But after the four horsemen, a lot of people don't read any further. And when you get to verse 12 of chapter 6, this is when it is stated something very interesting that is not stated during the, the apocalypse of the four horsemen. Starting in verse 12, this is the sixth seal. The sixth seal is open. Now I'm going to read this. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Does that sound 
familiar. Uh, can anybody say Joel chapter two? Okay. <clears throat> All right, and the and the stars, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as the fig tree cast her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heavens departed as a scroll. That would be a wonder. <clears throat> the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled up together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth, here we go. This is, this is not said anywhere else pertaining to any of the other seals. It's only at the sixth seal that this is said. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to withstand it? It is probably the most intelligent thing that the earth dwellers utter out of their mouths during the entire seven year period of the tribulation. Because they recognize that the wrath of God is now abiding upon them. It is not recognized in seals one through five only here and from here forward to the to the rest of the, the the book it is recognized that the wrath of God is being poured out but not in not during the time of the four horsemen it is entirely possible that the church could see, because we don't know when the rapture is going to be, could see some of these events. And because of some of these events, could lead to the next great revival before the return of the Lord for His church, what we had called the Herpazzo, not the second coming. All right? So, we don't know what we're going to see, but know this. We need to be about the business of the Lord. Yes, look up for your redemption draws nigh, but make hay while the sun shines. Be busy about the Lord's business until he comes. All right, I want to read one more thing. Just one more thing. It's in, to, it's in this week's Torah portion leading up to Feast of Trumpets, all right, and it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, and this is what it says. The, and remember, we are now in the week, the Feast of Trumpets, because this is uh, pertaining to, this is, uh, this is the Torah portion starting on the 16th, all right, so... We're still in this time period. This is what it says. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. What did it just say? It said, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. We have been spending so much time trying to discern the secret things that belong to God, and yet at the same time ignoring, or maybe not ignoring, but putting off to the side those things which are clearly stated. 
Notice what it says. And shall obey... Uh, <clears throat> let's see. I, I just uh, jumped ahead. But those things which are revealed belong to us. These are the things that we are able to lay hold of. These are the things tangible. These are the things that we can own. The things that have been revealed belong to us and to our children for how long? Forever. You know, we've been given the Great Commission to go into the entire world preaching the gospel, laying hands on the sick, casting out demons. This is our mission. And the gospel is this, very simply, that Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is our mandate, our mission statement. This is what we are to do until he comes and let him find us busy in doing well. Can we work on the puzzle of trying to unravel the secret things of God? Absolutely. Should we become so preoccupied with it that we lose focus of those things that are known to us to do? Absolutely not. And this is my biggest concern. So, I am going to leave you be. I'm going to come to Scott's defense on something here in the very next video. So until then...